Well, hello there and thank you for staying with us right here on ATV Uganda. My name is Romeo Busuka and of course I'm here with a very pertinent uh, conversation. Sexuality Education on World Sexual Health Day. What is the global theme today? Turn it on, sexuality education in a digital world. And now, um, yes, our other theme right here that we're going to be focusing on is actually we're going to be talking a look at uh, focusing on sexuality education in midst a digitized uh, world and also a COVID-19 that is wreaking havoc on so many of our people within this world. We do know that uh, sexuality education was actually banned uh, within Ugandan schools in 2016. That is courtesy of the Ministry of Education. You did see that taking center stage. But then later on, within 2018, the Ministry of Education actually resuscitated the same program. But two years on, it has not been implemented, the National Sexuality Education Framework. And that's why we are here, to talk about sexuality education. By the age of 15, young boys are already engaging in sexual acts. By the age of 15, young girls are already engaging in sexual acts. We do know that the young boys are around 68% engage in those sexual acts by the age of 15. And uh, those girls, by the age of 15 are around 62 percent so the situation is really debilitating in that regard but I do have a host of panelists with whom we are going to be trying to break down this conversation on sexuality education I do have Martha Clara Nakato an advocate with sexual reproductive health and rights Alliance Uganda and I also have Mr. Kanba Sam he is a teacher in Bujiri the head teacher of uh, Ndocha primary school we also do have Mr. Anguio Dennis a head teacher Hana International School hello there thank you for joining us right here here on ATV Uganda. You're welcome. All right, I'm going to start with you, Mr. Anguio Dennis. You are the head teacher of uh, Hana International School. First of all, what is sexuality education? Uh, sexuality mm -hmm. education entails quite a number. It mm -hmm. involves provision of basic information mm. to, to the young people and the children so that they can make informed decisions about their sexual rights. Mm. Uh, its major focus is to prepare young children so that as they grow up, mm. they, they can make independent, lifelong decisions mm. to sustain their life in many years to come mm. as they move on. Mm. Yeah. All right. Who actually should, it, should be imparting this kind of information among our children? That is the biggest, biggest conversation that I've been hearing left, right, and center. Is it the teachers? Is it the parents? Is it their peers? Youth-friendly corners? Uh, sexuality education takes uh, a number of dimensions, mm. from the informal to the formal. Mm. It therefore calls all stakeholders, the parents, relatives, layman, mm. person, the church leaders, the, the, the government. So it, it is a holistic that uh, it, a holistic content mm. that calls for a multi-sectoral approach to mm. its implementation. Mm. You cannot apportion it to uh, a given single sector. It calls for a general inclusion of the public mm. into it. Mm. However, because of its uh, formal uh, concept mm. or complexity that's when the teaching personnel are uh, coming mm. the teacher uh, part of it however it is for all of us to embrace but it according to the statistics we are receiving mr dennis don't you think we are failing as a country when it comes to sexuality education you've seen skyrocketing cases of teenage pregnancies taking center stage during this covid 19 pandemic you you had my statistics in my preamble 62 percent of our young girls by the age of 15 they are engaging in sexual acts and uh, 68% of the boys are already engaging in those same sexual acts. Don't you think we've lost the ball as government, as parents, as the community? Uh, following the passing on of mm. the sexuality education framework by the government of Uganda, mm. it has taken long to come into play. Indeed. And that's w one core reason why we are having this number skyrocketing every now mm. and, and then. W I, I do believe that if we come uh, as stakeholders and look at this as a a major problem affecting young people and children in this country, mm. it's better we start implementing this, pro, uh, this concept mm. as early as yesterday. Mm. Uh, the, the, the more we delay, the, the more we are allowing this younger generation access information that's not saved according to age levels. Mm. So it ends up misleading them. But if we look at this and say we are coming up with a particular tool mm. that it's going to guide the younger generation in this dimension, mm. then we are bound to, to limit the, the, the skyrocketing uh, percentage mm. to, to that level and even bring it down the mm. more, okay? So it, it is uh, 
a failure on our side mm -hmm. uh, as parents because we confine this information. Mm -hmm. We conceal them mm -hmm. and fail to expose these children to it. Mm -hmm. And the more we keep information get kept mm -hmm. or so much locked, the younger generation become more curious. Mm -hmm. They want to know why are they limiting us from accessing this. Mm -hmm. So you, you find them uh, exploring what is beyond their doors mm. and that's why you find the percentage going uh, up and up I really appeal to all uh, force mm. agents mm. that is looking at sexual education as a major factor in this mm. country that we advocate and dismantle all barriers mm. that are limiting the implementation mm. of sexual education in the country mm. and we move uh, to have uh, a sexual upright children who know what is right at a, a given age mm. and what uh, their values stand for mm -hmm. in terms of uh, sexuality. All right, Mr. Basan Khan is a head teacher at uh, Bujiri, in Bujiri, that is in Docha Primary School, in Bujiri Municipality, and you've been doing the most when it comes to uh, sexuality education among your learners. You haven't received, uh, registered a single pregnancy within your school because we would like to know how you were able to do it because of the statistics we are receiving right now. I was doing some research and I discovered that the Minister of Gender, it has a unit uh, that takes care of children mm -hmm. and its head is called uh, Lydia Najemba Wasula. She is the head of the uh, Child Wellbeing Implementation Unit at the Ministry of Gender. So she professed and said it was hard for her during the COVID-19 pandemic to even teach her own children. So if a land person, a land government official fails to actually impart this kind of sexuality education among her own children, so how about that rural uh, family uh, that has a, 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 a head that never went to school? We are talking about a mother who never went to school. How will she impart this kind of education among her children? Uh, thank you very much mm. for a case. This is how we mm. made it. Mm. The word is sexuality education is something like broad to the public, to the community. Mm. We had to simplify it. And we made sure that uh, it was passed to the parents and all stakeholders in the school. We looked at it as uh, a way of how an individual feels the behavior of an individual, um, the biological makeup of, of an individual, and then we also brought in whole school approach. Actually, at our place, mm. we categorized uh, three areas where these children would be helped. At the school level, we looked at the matrons, we looked at the peer educators, we looked at the teachers, and we made sure we are at a level that children would see us as uh, their parents, substitutes of the parents. Me per se, uh, children call me uh, dada. Dada literally means grandfather. And uh, uh, female teachers are referred as aunties, male teachers are referred as uncles. That has helped the children to be very near us and they easily express what they feel like it is right and wrong. What I know in life is that children, what you tell them not to do is what they find themselves doing. Hmm. And uh, in this era, we have also realized that the parents have very little time for their children. They wake up at 6, out for work, children come late in the evening, parents are not yet there. We thought it, it was necessary for us to come on board. So, leaving aside uh, the element of... Uh, young talk initially that had been brought in our school and it was branded as guso we also looked at a way how to sustain and because of um, coming together discussing together mm. we found it was necessary to put a sexuality education on timetable mm. that was issue number one two we also realized it was very important for us to talk about uh, sexuality education, if in case there is any platform like uh, assembles, like uh, parades, like uh, parents' meetings. Mm. We also realized it was also very important for us mm. to have the peer educators when it comes to Sundays, when it comes to Fridays, these children could go out like it was an outreach mm. program mm. to sell the idea that has really helped us. Mm. We were also giving them life skills, giving the children life skills, like they should be assertive, eh? self-esteem. 
Which relationship? Which relationship are they building? Mm. Good relationship with the friends? So All those ones is who, important. Uh, yeah. uh, very good. Mm. All those ones who will make them off-road. Mm. And actually it has given us a way. Leaving that aside, mm. uh, we moved it to a way of scaling up. When we saw it was working in our school, we had it to scale up to other schools. Mm. So we had intervist mm. school uh, uh, competitions on sexuality education, mm. debate on sexuality education. We even have a uh, full file for young talk magazines that we kept since 2004 to 2018 where we used to be given, and I feel the information is there, mm. still caters for the children. Mm. They are still very vital. Mm. Yes, please. But why is it that we have seen resistance coming in from some sections of the community, especially religious leaders, against this uh, subject, sexuality education? Why do you think there's so much against having this uh, conversation with our children, religious leaders? It is just because of misconception. They have not understood what is a sexual education. But what I know with the sexuality education, mm. it begins at the age of, I think it is even a, 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 at birth, sexuality education begins. Mm. Because you are supposed to cover the child, that is already sexuality education. Mm. Sit proper, that is sexuality education. Mm -hmm. eh? uh, girls, this is doll, you are free to play, that is sexuality education. Mm. It is just misconception that people have not understood. Mm -hmm. Just like initially, people had never understood what is a family planning. They used it to think family planning is producing few children, not knowing that it was to produce children that you can manage. Indeed. So it was the thing all around there. And um, I would also say, to our case, I think we are very successful. Mm. The school is uh, surrounded with a, an area that children, especially girls, could be off so easily because it is a center that trailers park there. Mm -hmm. Just imagine. Mm -hmm. So we would expect our, our children, especially girls, to go off. They are the same girls nowadays at this era that mm -hmm. they are helping the parents. They sell off, they hawk around with the tomatoes, what? But registering pregnancy, it is a history in the school. That is uh, Basan Khan. He is the head teacher of Undocha Primary School in Bujiri Municipality. We also have Dennis Anguio. He is actually the head teacher of Hana International uh, Secondary School. We also do have, that is Martha Nakato. She is an advocate with Sexual Reproductive Health and Rights Alliance Uganda. In case you've just joined us, this is a conversation largely centering around sexual health, and it comes in the wake of World Sexual Health Day. Uh, the global theme is Turn It On, Sexual Health in a Digital World. And our context tool theme today is actually focusing on uh, sexuality education amidst digitization and COVID-19. What do we mean by that? We mean that now that we are calling on to many of our young learners to actually take advantage of the internet, they are actually exposed to so much pornography on the internet. Sexual gender-based violence has been taking center stage on the internet. So as we uh, egg on our young children to actually go onto the internet, we should be cognizant of that fact, that they are perpetrators ready to take advantage of that fact. I did mention that uh, Lydia Najemba was Sula. She is the head of the um, Child Wellbeing Implementation Unit in the Ministry of Gender. She professed and said it was hard for her to actually teach her own children about sexuality education during the lockdown. And a year ago, around September 16th, it was Wednesday, the Ministry of Gender also released their communique and they said young learners are being exposed to pornography online. Yes, as a result of the government online uh, learning program, they were being exposed because many of them were downloading information, yes, that was pornographic in nature. And if you do not actually guide your children on what kind of information they access on the internet or get keep the information that they access on the internet, we shall end up with uh, cases whereby sexual gender-based violence continues, skyrocketing teenage pregnancies continue, incest incest has been rife during this COVID-19 lockdown. Remember, these children are in their home settings and they're studying on the internet. So if this young lad accesses pornography on the internet, what are, what are they going to do? If a sister is there, that's going to happen. If a brother is there, something is going to happen. So incest has taken center stage. And if it befalls a, a home, or a homestead where the parent is actually neglecting these children, it's a recipe for disaster. In our midst, we have a young 
person. Yes, that is Nakatum, Nakatumatha Clara. She is an advocate with SRHR Alliance Uganda. So we would like to talk about what are some of those challenges that young girls are facing during this COVID-19 pandemic and what kind of information have they been accessing on the internet? Whom are they comfortable with when it comes to this subject on sexuality education? Martha, engage us. I'll maybe just add through uh, what my two colleagues just mm. highlighted, that when you look at the context that we are working in as a mm. country, we are working in, a, in an environment that is uncertain. Indeed. And by that, I mean that we do not have progressive policies that can guide us to maybe pass on information, but also to guide the key mm. gatekeepers, the parents, mm. the teachers, the communities, on how they can give right information to the, the young The National people. Sexuality Education Framework doesn't help? It's one of the policies out the, there. It's, it's out mm. here, but it is not implemented. It is right. not. Mm. When you look at the school health policy, mm. it's out there, but it's not implemented. It's, you know, mm. when you look at all the backlashes. So if we want to have progressive access for information, mm. age appropriate information for young people, there need to be laws, guidelines, or even frameworks that guide mm. in that way key gatekeepers will be able to understand their roles and responsibilities because we all know that sexual health come with responsibilities, they come with rights, mm. but they also come with the individual knowing what those rights are, mm. what is expected of them, mm -hmm. where can they look out for the information in case they need it, where can they look out for the services, yes, who can they turn to. Mm. So as we discuss at the digital context, which mm. is right now, turn it on, mm. discussing it in the digital world. COVID has proved that digital is the way to go. Indeed. But how are young people safer in these spaces? And just as you highlighted mm. earlier, and also uh, Mr. Khan highlighted, the mm. truth is parents do not have time. And if you look at the allies, the corporate parents, mm. most of their children, by the age of six, they already have access to smartphones. You that's, know? that's a fact. A child is studying, you know, online this. So also looking they'll at the They don't even start at the age of three. <laughs> I mean, they don't even know what they're doing, but the mm -hmm. parent will just let them play with the iPad. Yes. <laughs> I've <The> seen it happen. <laughs> yes. yeah. So the risk that comes with mm. that, how safe are our children on online spaces? Mm. You know, we've also seen a number of cases where even women are attacked online. You know? Yes. Women mm -hmm. are coerced. They are violated. And all these are things that we keep quiet. Mm. You know? because no one is there to address them. So I think that as we move forward to progress around uh, promoting sexuality education as a country, mm. we need to make sure that there are laws, progressive laws, laws that are effectively implemented and laws that are able to guide mm. the gatekeepers, but also the young people to know. Because the reality is uh, a num majority of the young people get information from their fellow peers. Mm. So if you have a peer who does not have information, you're likely to get wrong information that is going to tamper. I, in my case, Martha Nakato, I did not get any of this sexuality education information from any of my peers. Mm -hmm. it's, it was from a school mm -hmm. setting, mm -hmm. and it was at the age of 10. I was in primary four. And to be honest, I felt like it was too late for me because I felt like I should have gotten this kind of information by the age of eight, by mm -hmm. the age of yeah. six and earlier. But then it wasn't too late. So the question of when, should these young children be given this all this information is really, really important. So True. which age is appropriate? True. So uh, for me, I personally believe that uh, from the word go, because young people are unique, and those ages are unique in mm. a way. The kind of information that you will give to a two-year-old, to a three-year-old, depends in the appropriateness of that information, mm. you mm. know? But also looking at the risks that come mm. with a girl during the puberty age, mm. so you know the girl needs to know me having my breasts coming out does not mean that I'm ready to engage into sexual activities. Mm. Me menstruating, mm. and this has shown that a number of women who have their first menstrual, they are likely to even get pregnant mm. because they don't know. So how do we package information, even as parents? And, and, and whom do you run to for this information? A, a young girl is going to get her menstrual period, and then she's going to run to some member of the community who's going to say, no, that's because you're ripe for mm. marriage. And then another one who is learned, maybe in a school setting, will be like, no, 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 that is normal. It's part of biology. Mm -hmm. So where you access your information, I believe it's really, really important. True. Some True. spaces will mislead you, yes. and True. other spaces will point you in the right direction. Mm -hmm. Go ahead. So um, as we highlighted earlier that mm. um, promoting sexuality education for young people really mm. requires a shared responsibilities for all people. Indeed. But if even we, the parents, do not 
have the information or we've decided to shy away from talking about it, it still brings us to the problem, the misconception that people have around, is it sexuality education or sex education? Mm -hmm. And that's where the backlash comes. People, w a lot of our fires that come with the discussion is around the misconceptions they have. Mm -hmm. So how can we support parents on that sexuality mm -hmm. is about supporting the young people to understand mm -hmm. The physical, the physical challenges they mm -hmm. face, mm -hmm. the emotional challenges they face, how they can even coexist, how they can get to deal with their emotions. Because we know as a kid cries mm -hmm. when he's born, what does that mean? Mm -hmm. It's alive. When a kid cries, it's hungry. You know, so mm -hmm. putting it into context, I think that is one area that we need to look mm -hmm. at. All right. Yeah. Thank you very much, Martha Nakato Clara. She is an advocate with Sexual Reproductive Health and Rights Alliance Uganda. We are talking about World Sexual Health Day, and it couldn't come at an opportune moment to have this discussion when COVID-19 is wreaking a lot of havoc. People's livelihoods have been turned upside down. Young people alike have been so much affected, and uh, since they do not have this sexuality education, that actually compounded more of their problems. Like I did contend in my preamble, 2016, we, see, we did see the burning of sexuality <coughs> education within our schools. The ministry of education actually contended that many of these schools were orienting our children when it comes to homosexuality. That's, that was their reason. But then in 2018, we did see the resuscitation of the same with the introduction of the National Sexuality Education Framework, which has largely not been implemented up to now. So that was the biggest problem. We entered the COVID-19 pandemic without a clear framework being implemented to impart this kind of information among our children. So largely, the parents during this lockdown did not know, is it my role to actually impart this kind of information in the learners the teachers were nowhere to be seen because the schools were closed so meaning the children were stuck at home and we're also getting statistics that before the pandemic hit the biggest um, uh, the most uh, the biggest the place where you know the abuses were rife among children were homes yeah mm. can you believe <coughs> that Dennis Anguio children were being violated within their homes the most even before the pandemic yeah. then the schools uh, came second then the communities came third Expound more on that. It seems like it's not even COVID-19 that has thrown us into this problem. It has been here since time immemorial. Mm -hmm. Girls are being abused, especially within their homes. Uh, thank you. Uh, within this period mm -hmm. of the second lockdown, mm -hmm. uh, people, especially the young children, mm -hmm. have been uh, tortured abused. Mm. You see, the, the, the school environment, having children port back to school, mm. breaks the bond that will be existing be between the person who is going to abuse this child and the child himself. Mm. Because especially when you look at the boarding mm. setting, the child is put into the boarding section, therefore there is a communication gap that is already created. Mm. So confining children in school protects them more from the, the, the wild community mm. and that's now what, that's what we thought that confining them in mm. schools protects them from the community but then they're being violated in the, in the homes before they come to the schools mm -hmm. the, 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 that's that, that's now mm. home issue as, as you earlier mentioned incest is, is there indeed so, so that's why people might ask so whose role is it to impart this kind of uh, sexual education if it's right within the homes it should be the parent but then here you have a parent who is saying it is not my role it is the teacher's role mr angu you're on the other w side we, we we are talking mm. uh, wh what is happening the abuse mm. that means it's already it's sex happened. education mm -hmm. but when we are talking about sexual education mm -hmm. where we are mis uh, understanding the two mm -hmm. concepts sexuality education and then sex education mm -hmm. so in the concept we are talking today it is sexuality education mm -hmm. so the abuse means somebody has gone even beyond the sex education mm -hmm. you see that mm -hmm. so where 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 we are uh, talking today mm. is sexuality education mm. which the public is so much misunderstanding with the sex education mm. in a home setting the, the abuse may be beyond the sex based uh, violence mm. of course there are other kind of tortures the children are going through in the home what in the home setting mm. the, the, the fact that we have agreed that uh, sex uh, sexuality education takes different domains so amid this, those tortures mm. again there is an abuse of sexuality mm. which I, I, I as an advocate or a head teacher of a school wouldn't it love to have it in a situation where we are now moving into a digital world. Mm. I further added to the public 
that uh, we think that amid digitalization, mm -hmm. students should not access certain information. But locking information or depriving children from accessing information is one way of coercive action. Mm -hmm. D d look at an action that happened in the country d during the, the, the election era. Internet w was switched off. Mm. But people devised the other options. The younger generation believe in the philosophy that when one door closes, another one must open. So when you, you, you go and hinder them from accessing this information, mm. you are not doing them the best. They are going to access what other information that you do not know. The fact is, they are aggressive via research hmm. compared to we, the, the, the old generation. Yeah. Okay. Mm. I also want to uh, put uh, reference to your mm. uh, question earlier you yeah. asked here. Mm. At what age is it appropriate? Mm. The education sexuality framework mm. provided by the country spells it out that from age three mm. to age 18, mm. even and above, at my age, I still need sexuality education, and, and I believe, Indeed. so are we here? <laughs> so l l learning Indeed. is endless. It's a continuous process. It's yes. a continuous process. Mm. So we, we cannot limit at a certain age, mm -hmm. but what we need to scale down, what is appropriate for that age? Uh, you see, what I've noticed, and uh, uh, based on the investigations NMG has been conducting mm -hmm. on the subject, there is too much talk and less action that is happening, just like with the National Sexu Sexuality Education Framework. It has not been implemented in 2018, but it looks very, very good on paper. It's mm -hmm. just that religious leaders feel like uh, there's too much foreign material within it, and they feel like Ugandan values need to be uh, reflected within the framework. But then, here we are. Hmm? We are saying when it comes to sexuality education, it is a concerted effort. Rome Busiku, Basan Khan, Martha Nakato, that's what we say. But when we go away from the studios, when we go back to reality, everyone just relaxes. Yeah. Yeah. The parent will relax, the teacher will relax, the community members will relax. So the question is, we have all these good ideas, but whose role is it to protect our children, to impart this kind of information? When we say it is a concerted effort, everyone neglects it. The parent will say, it is the teacher. The teacher will say, no, 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 it is the parent. So there is that blame game that is happening, Ms. Anguyo. Mr. Mr. Mm. Meo, yes, uh, at least uh, the challenge that we are having mm. currently is that we don't walk the talk. Indeed. That is one. Mm. Then two, there are certain violations that are taking place at home, mm. but parents are not knowing that they are violating their children. Mm. Here are examples. Mm. And partly it is just because of poverty and ignorance. All right. Here is a parent who is telling the children to move with the tomatoes to sell. Mm. But the child is coming back at 9, 10 p.m. Now just imagine at that time darkness, what would happen? Why is it happening? Because of the poverty. Two, here is a parent who is using one room as a bedroom, mm. sitting room, and even the children are putting up there. What next? So the parent is exposing the exp young children yes. to this kind of uh, pornographic images. Here is a parent who is poor but is not managing to pay for the feeding of the child. Mm. However, that same parent who remains at home will be having a break, will have lunch, mm. and the child comes for a meal. Mm. So it calls upon all of us to sensitize the parents. First of all, to get to know the forms of the violation that they are uh, subjecting, their subjecting to their children, and then how we can help. I, as a teacher, I think it is our responsibility also to have home visits. Mm. So that it is not more of a uh, 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 blame Wait, game. Waiting for the so learners to come to the school yeah, setting. It is, it is the parents you who are supposed to, to do that. Right. I just remember one time, I don't know, it was 2019, a parent came to school and was like blaming the school for failure to help the son to bathe. To now, teach him to bathe. Uh, not to <laughs> teach him to bathe, but to bathe. So what we did, we, we had to, to apologize, mm. and we had a nearby bathroom, water was there, so the child, after bathing, actually, the parent was happy for that. I think he wanted to see how we respond. In a nutshell, the parent couldn't do it on their own, mm. and if you put it in the conce concept of uh, sexuality education, mm. they also want you to do it as teachers. Yes. 
Then I, I feel the, the sensitization. We are just talking here. It is not all the people in the country that they are watching what we are doing. Mm. But there is, there is need for this same information to be passed to different individuals at different platforms. I ever see people when they are going, when somebody has passed on, mm. the issue is to talk about that person. But if we could chip in sexuality education during the funeral, funeral rites, during the church service, during uh, the giving um, uh, meetings at school, I think something would be there. Mm. Perhaps the other worst part of it, I think, Partly, sexuality education is failing to work well because parents are assuming that the children belong to the government. So all the responsibilities should be handled by the by the government. Oh, and even they are very they are willing, they are very ready, waiting for the government even to feed their children at school. Hmm. You see. Now, if we can help to cut that gap, I think we shall reach there. All right. Mm. Let me also bring in uh, Martha Nakato Clara. You had something to say, and you can also add on and tell us how we can make our homes a safe haven for our children amidst this pandemic. So, for um, leaving all mm. factors constant, Indeed. before you become a journalist, before you become Indeed. a teacher, mm. before you become a president, mm. before you become anything, any title, mm. you are a parent. Indeed. Whether you've given birth to a child mm. or not, because you have siblings who have children. Indeed. I'm not a mother yet, but I have 19 children that mm. I'm looking after, my mm. nieces mm. and nephews. Mm. So it makes me a parent. Mm -hmm. You get mm. So I think that is the mentality that we need for parents to understand that you are responsible for your children. If you're not responsible for your children, no one is going to be responsible. Mm. If you do not take on the initiative to talk to your children, but also the question is how do you do it? Most times our but parents really are tough. Martha, let me tell you, it is really, really hard it for these is. parents to talk about sexuality it education. It my is. own mother, it, it was is. hard for her. My own yes. father, it was hard for him. But this is what I told them. I told them, no, I will not wait. True. I will not wait for a mistake to happen. They would rather hate me, but I'm going to tell them what the problem really is. I'm going to give them this information. You see, mother was like, she didn't want to engage these mm. young girls, my three sisters, when, with sexuality education because she, he, she didn't want to annoy them. Yeah. Mm. I, I don't want the girls to look at me as the enemy. I, I don't want to I want them to look good in their eyes. Yeah. I say, no, no, even if they hate me, I'm going to tell them. So I started giving them this information mm. when they were young. Six, mm. seven, eight, till they grew up, 18. The eldest is now 26. She doesn't have a child. She's never, none of them has ever had a child yeah. or gotten pregnant. So that is the case. Imparting this kind of information, some parents are desisting from mm. the practice. And this is a recipe for disaster. Not because they don't yeah. want, others do not have the information mm. and yeah. others do not have the know-how to actually engage their <coughs> children. Go ahead and expand more of that. So mm. ar around that point, it may not really be that the parent is imparting information mm. to the child, but how do you build a relationship with your child? Mm. You know, how can you make your child trust you? That in case they face the fires, in case they have under, undergone anything, mm. they are able to say it without fear. I was raised by a single dad, and it was mm. hard to talk about sexual uh, all issues, whether sexual what, all this. Mm. But at least he would say, in case you need anything to talk about, tell me. And he was quite deliberate to ask questions mm. that would open up a conversation, however uncomfortable mm. it was. So I think as, as parents, and this has been a challenge, we have not tried to build relationships with our children, you know, mm. and that is a place that is lacking. If there is no that relationship with your child, then there is no way you can easily open up. I think it's important for we young people, we the children, to look at our parents, <coughs> not in the image of them being parents, but as friends. Mm. you know mm. as mentors to really make it very easy for young people to open up but one thing that I would really love to highlight is that sexual health come with rights come with information come with uh, responsibilities and to achieve that we need all stakeholders at play Indeed. we need the policies that are progressive we need a community that is progressive a community that is supportive mm. and we need each and every individual acting and acting doesn't mean that in uganda many people have online spaces how do you use that online space just wake up a day and maybe you've seen something post it but it, we, we are in a country 
or in a world where it's very easy mm. for people to share wrong information and it will get very, very many, you know, tax because mm. people love chaos. Mm. But how do we use our digital spaces to communicate? How do we even find a young person who is maybe marketing those things? And you feel free to ask them something. I think that is the way we can start. Because mm. for me personally, my dad played his role. But I think where I am today is because I met people, random people, strangers, who you would ask and they would respond to you. Right here, I could tell you uh, unequivocally that uh, I'm thankful to the education system. Yeah. I don't know where I would be if it, if it wasn't for education. Like I told you, I did get my sexuality education at the age of 10, and this was in the school setting. None of the community members actually bothered yes. to tell us what we needed to do or not to do before that. So by the age of 10, I did get that information. And not from the local teachers. That is what is mind-boggling. It was a, a group of German teachers who actually traveled all the way from German, came to Uganda, and decided to just mount uh, uh, a campaign to actually impart this sexuality education mm -hmm. among our uh, learners. The local teachers were actually adamant to take on the same. Actually, many of them ran out of the classes. They were like, we cannot be a part of this because they thought it was <coughs> immoral. <coughs> That's how bad it was at the time. So here we are. COVID-19 has wreaked havoc on many of uh, the economies uh, around the world. Uh, schools have been shut down, so we are calling on to many of our children to get to access the internet to be able to get this information. But then digitization is also a problem. This harassment that is taking center stage sexual gender-based violence is also rife within these spaces. So whose role is it to safeguard our children, Dennis Anguio, when it comes to the internet? Uh, th thank you, uh, mm. Ro Romeo. I want first to take you to the, concept Please do. the context you put forward mm. here. Cultural, social, and gender inequality mm. influences expression of sexuality and sexual behavior. Yeah. Uh, per perhaps it is something that uh, we are giving an oversight. And uh, it, it has breeded a lot of myths and facts about sexuality education. The, 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 what you really explained wa was the reason why maybe people fail to open up to their children, mm. Mm. OK? Yeah. Calling these pampas as, as bread. I'm giving you bread. But why not mention it and it's going to do this and this and this and you're going to do the mention period. So we, 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 we have uh, uh, sugar-coated the conversation. The, the, the conversation mm. we, we have with our children. They, 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 they grow up knowing it in other names, but yet we are, are, are misleading mm. them. Uh, back to safeguarding our children regarding the information they are receiving mm. on, on, on the internet. Mm. I, I, I see internet has become now like an asset that everybody needs. Mm. Yeah. You, you want to do online classes, you need internet. You want to do some sh shopping for some food, domestic items, you need internet. Yeah. So internet is a basic uh, need, mm. I think, that we must now put mm. in, the, in, in this modern day world. Mm. Uh, Safeguarding it, I mean, say we don't you need to safeguard it we don't need to safeguard the information our children are accessing we the not, internet. not to safeguard internet but we need to regulate the information our right. our our young people oh are you mean accessing. we don't need to block the internet but we need to all yeah, right yes we, so, so they, they, we don't need to block the internet mm. or we need it just to have a regulatory body mm. that Reg monitors the kind of information that our children good. are we're, we're accessing. Mm. We, we have some countries that uh, have put it clear that this information mm. I is not accessible. All right. Yeah. So I if we have UCC, e mm. UCC taking control of our digital space, mm. then, then it should come into play and save information that is vital for our economy as Uganda. Mm. And then it's what the generation should should access, mm. Ra rather than leaving uh, the, the, the space uh, open for everybody. Mm -hmm. uh, however, that position, I may say, may be a rough position. All right. The ideal would be sensitizing <coughs> the world of what is healthy and what is unhealthy. Yeah. All right. And, and in, in, in so doing, we would have re responsible people mm. or responsible young people mm. coming into the digital space to search for information. Otherwise, I believe 
that it is a matter of sensitizing for them to access what is healthy and appropriate for them. All right, this conversation on sexuality education comes in the wake of World Sexual Health Day that is being commemorated today. Why do we commemorate World Sexual Health Day? We commemorate this day, yes, because we want to break down the taboos, the cultural and social taboos that have befallen the conversation about sexuality education and also promote positive sexual health around the world. Here in Uganda, according to the National Sexual Framework, uh, edu National Sexual <coughs> Education <coughs> Framework, yes, 2018, it, it actually contains that... Uh, our young learners right here, uh, children by the age of 15, they are engaging in sexual acts. 68% are girls, 62% are boys. And uh, those young people between the ages of 15 to 24 have already contracted HIV, 5% of those. So that's how bad the situation is. And that's why we are having this conversation with Mr. Dennis Anguyo. He is a head teacher with uh, Hana International School. We also do have uh, Martha. Yes, Martha Clara. She is an advocate with SRHR Alliance Uganda and also another head teacher with uh, Ndocha Primary School in Bujidi Municipality, Basan Khan. Mr. Basan Khan, we are talking about digitization. So whose role is it to protect uh, the kind of information, our learners who are accessing the internet then? Uh, thank you very much. Mm -hmm. uh, to me, first of all, I, I feel it is everyone's role. Mm -hmm. And uh, when you talk about uh, dig digital, mm -hmm. it does not only mean the smartphone. Mm -hmm. It goes even to the TV issue set. Mm, the yeah. the programs they watch. They the watch. Mm. The good part on the TV I've yeah. seen, like a program, Parents Guide, mm. PG, mm -hmm. 13 and so on. Mm. So they, like TV programs, there is something that they are trying. Mm. However, you will never watch um, on a TV and you spend something like five minutes without seeing the two kissing each other and so forth. Which we are feeling it, uh, mm -hmm. uh, which we are also feeling it is inducing these children to a world that they are not yet there. Mm -hmm. And funny thing is, the parents will just continue watching. But they will watch. the parents in the living room, and no one will but even be bothered watch. to switch to they another channel. <laughs> but uh, sometimes it is. They will just say, maybe, <laughs> young eyes. person A, mm. close your eyes. And or sometimes they are told, go and fetch water. And then by the time they come <laughs> back, I think it would have. It but would the damage is already Yeah, done. the yeah. damage is already mm. there. Then, uh, me, I would imagine. Yes, sir. What used to work um, so many years back, it is mm. not working right now. Yeah. And that like, is um, I will give about three, four examples. Sometimes back, I do understand uh, boys, could, the parents could look for them, the wives to marry, mm -hmm. wives to be. Mm -hmm. It is not working right now. Mm -hmm. But it's still happening. In uh, some, uh, mm. some, some small, small yeah. areas. Yeah, some then um, I, I remember also there was a moment where parents could sit with their children, tell them stories mm. that the stories were quite moral that could build them well, which is not happening. Parents are not having time. But still, digital has to go. That is the way to go. Now, how best can we help our children? I think we need to put personnel at different uh, uh, areas that can help. Like in primary schools, we have senior man teacher, senior woman teacher, those people can do a lot. We have mm. peer educators. Mm. Now, when we go to the community, I think we have now a new title on LC level. They are referred as Nabachala. Mm, Nabachala. They are supposed to help in that direction. Mm. Now, parents, I think the issue of the Sengaz has died. I've ever seen even on a, like on a wedding, somebody will pick an individual and say, you know what, I request you are going to be my Senga. So we have even artificial Sengas. But if we could, <laughs> if we could, uh, if we could That's at a least, good one, uh, go ahead. Uh, if we could at least go back mm. to our, uh, our culture, I think something would be working for us a bit. All right. Mm. I would also think uh, there is a problem here uh, between now mm. the health uh, department mm. and the society. The health uh, department at a certain interval, I don't know whether it is legally allowed or it is illegal, um, um, girls of a certain age that 
they, they are suspecting can easily become pregnant. Mm. They have been introduced to, to family planning, uh, cons uh, contraceptives like in, uh, pills, like injections, which I feel has an effect. Mm. It would be just better for these children to continue getting sexual education. That but in the wake them. of a defilement, this young girl has been defiled, this young girl doesn't want to get pregnant, mm -hmm. and the pill is an option. What do you think, Bassan? Would you still discourage the use of contraceptives in such emergencies? I, I think, you know, but what I'm trying to explain mm. it is in the way that he sh she has not yet been defiled, mm. but I feel the prevention is better than cure, something of that kind, oh, yeah. which I feel it is not appropriate mm -hmm. yet. More like telling your child, if you want to have sex, here's a condom. Uh, use a condom. It's bad. Mm. It's bad information. Uh, but it, now you are encouraging You're the encouraging child to, the to child. start the sex. I see. And actually, I've also realized somewhere, somehow, mm. We are trying to carry out sexual education, mm -hmm. but at least as if we are leaning on one side. I see. It looks like we are more on the side of girls mm -hmm. and boys uh, left out. are left out. And of course, when it comes to sexuality education, because I was doing the People's Parliament in December mm -hmm. of last year, 2020, and we did notice that there were 3,000 pregnancies within Kavali. That's how bad the situation mm -hmm. was. And then they were talking about some recommendations on how to alleviate the problem. And the biggest recommendation that came up was we need to engage the young boys mm -hmm. because yeah. they are the perpetrators in this yes. case. Mm -hmm. So if you engage these young boys in activities that keep them busy, developmental activities, maybe agriculture, there's something here and there that keeps them busy, something developmental, they wouldn't think about dating this young girl and then teenage pregnancies would be put to a halt. What do you think about engaging the young boys as a solution? I Me, mean, I think it is a very good idea, but fathers have now left their responsibilities. Indeed. And that is why nowadays you get many <coughs> hotels operating in different places. Because fathers, instead of buying food at home, will eat in the hotel, goes home, says, see, see I'm sick, <laughs> but in the reality, he has eaten what he wanted, <laughs> you see? But if fathers could also take the responsibility, like a few mothers mm. who take it that they talk to their girls, mm. and fathers who talk to the boys, mm. and I think it is a responsibility of the two. Mm. Then I think we should go to this, uh, we can adopt the, the, the Western uh, style of, uh, like all of you sharing the same meal, same mm. round table, that the thing is still a problem. Like like, uh, we really see the father should have the table, eat alone. Boys are also sharing somewhere. It is the mother who is sitting with the girls, and that is the in time. In some families, the father will eat first at the dining table, move away, and then yeah. the rest of the family will join. Which is not good. I don't uh, think uh, it is something. <laughs> 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 and, and uh, yeah, b before you pitch in, uh, I still wanted to engage Bassan. Mm. Bassan, there's also this other issue. Teachers are really adamant to engage their learners on sexuality education. There's been this blame game. No, it should be the parents, should be the government, not us uh -huh. as teachers. Uh, explain to me that case, why it is the tradition right here in Uganda. You've been breaking it. Mm. You haven't registered a single pregnancy. Yes. But in other jurisdictions, in other schools where teachers have neglected the conversation and sexual education and left it to the parents, it is a recipe for disaster. Young learners have been dropping out within their schools. But then, let's try to understand these teachers. Why are they adamant to have this conversation? Um, Learned as they are. I, I, I mm. think they have not been making it in the way that they don't know how to tell their children. I see. Okay. Now, for our case in our school, <coughs> basing on uh, the magazines that uh, Straight Talk used to give us, the Young Talk, mm. we came up with a curriculum. Mm. And we could agree that this week, in a week we, u we always have sexual education once. It is always on Wednesday in our school, uh, that is at, uh, at 3.30 up to 4.30. We gave it a full hour. Now, for our case, what did we do that can be coped by other stakeholders, the parents, and so on, is that we have grouped these learners, 20, 20, per any individual that is in the school. The cook are involved. Uh, we have mini boarding. Matrons are involved. All teachers are involved. The whole value chain. And even the peer educators are involved. Now, the 20 who are grouped with one individual mm -hmm. to help, before we approach them and give them the information, we first sit and agree what should we give to the other 20 people that we are going to meet. So it means during lunchtime, that is at one up to two, 
the, the ones that will pass the information to the 20 mm. meet and agree how to pass the information. <coughs> and we have even encouraged these children to have where to not. We have even put their suggestion in box whereby um, they put where they, they, they would feel they, they cannot easily express in the public. So when we pick uh, during assembles, we get solution for that. <coughs> now, we have moved it to a level that we have developed guiding books and our parents are free to come and sign for them mm -hmm. that can help them in their homes mm -hmm. to continue at least de guiding this student. Great initiative. And um, we have also encouraged the parents mm -hmm. never to use statements like, I am preparing you for marriage. You see now when you will become a mother, eh? Those when you will become a age. father. Yes. <laughs> at least let's have something like when you will become a doctor. <laughs> eh? When you will become a lawyer. Mm. At least let Wonderful. marriage be something after you have achieved wow. your goal. Mm. Then, to me, I've believed that the children that we teach, there are three categories. There are those ones who are bright, there are those ones who are average, and there are those ones who are mm. to mm. somewhere there. Mm. Now, the ones, when you assess properly, you will get to know that those ones who are, I mean, those ones who are weak, mm. they are the ones who are facing serious challenges of pregnancy, dropping out of school. Why? Because the attention is not given to them. Teachers will befriend instead the bright ones are the ones who carry for us the books. Mm. The weak ones are looked like they are already failures in it life. I think if we change our attitude, I our I mindset. I think even in the home settings, uh, Basan, <laughs> if a child is not performing well, a parent will be like, mm -mm, this one we are wasting time I on school fees. Mm -hmm. you, you should be ready and prepared for mar marriage. So such statements. And even the report is looked at like, um, like, mm -mm, why, 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 why do you become last? Mm. There is a boy in our school last year told me he, he, he has been helping us to do wiring, mm. minor wiring of mm. electricity. And um, in 2018, our school moved up to Gulu to participate in music. So, but when it came to Mox in primary seven, right. he was the second last. Now, he came and told me, now, d Dada, mm. Grandpa, yeah. why is it that on the report, such comments like weak results. But remember participating in the Gulu and getting that position, I participated. Wiring lights that yeah. the children are using to mm. study, I participate. Why can't you also thank me in that direction? I, I, I really felt guilty. We're wrong. We're supposed to say thanks for that your That is Hassan Khan for you, the head teacher of Undolcha Primary School. We also do have Martha Nakato Clara. She is an advocate with Sexual Rights, uh, Sexual Reproductive Health and Rights Alliance Uganda. Dennis Anguyo, the head teacher of Hana in international uh, school. We are actually talking about World Sexual Health Day. We commemorate this day to actually break taboos, uh, cultural taboos, social taboos that are associated with sexuality to, in a bit to promote positive sexual health around the world. Now, Nakato Clara Martha, we've been talking about what the other stakeholders, parents, teachers and government ought to be doing, but not actually focusing on the people we want to actually engage, the young people. What are some of the challenges that have befallen them during this COVID-19 pandemic, especially when it comes to this subject on sexuality education, accessing information, and so forth. So um, one thing I'm going to really highlight mm. is still the access to information. Mm. It's there helpful. could be mm. available information where young people can get the information, mm. but how can they access accurate information with the right intentions of that information mm. from someone who is knowledgeable? Mm. Um, Mr. Khan highlighted something that when you tell a child uh, like ac have condoms mm. i also want to clarify that giving young people information mm. does not amount to an invitation for them to engage in too risky behaviors yeah, it doesn't amount mm. to that i remember when i was uh, it's 16, not a green card it's mm. not i remember when i was 16 years my dad sat me down and he told me if you ever mm. want to engage with a boy mm. i feel you're very young you have a bright future mm. but in case temptations come speak about a condom but also ask that man three questions mm. are you ready to be a father are you ready to marry me are you ready to take care of me mm. and my clan <laughs> and i remember those words Indeed. so as i've grown up now and reflecting i realized that also parents mm. away from you you need to train us the young people and indeed, and indeed mother, i can attest <laughs> to that i can attest <laughs> to that mother gave me a condom when i joined senior one that was 14. Mm -hmm. i kept it in my bag for over six years 
and I never used it. It was in there. I would just look at it and I'm like, okay, okay, okay. It, it reminded you. It reminded you. It reminded you that someone takes care of me, True. thinks about me, so thinks I should not you. get in, uh, or engage in any kind of risky behavior. So it's never a green card mm -hmm. handing this condom to a child. It reminds them that, you know what, I have someone who thinks about me. Yes wants to take care of me and wants the best for yes. me, which is education. Yes. And, and they think if I'm to engage in any risky behavior, yes. I should use this as a last, last resort. Last resort. Indeed. And that also brings us to the point of creating options mm. for young people. Mm. A as number a of times mm. we've talked about our young people issues to do with sexuality education. Abstain from sex, be faithful. I am not married. Use condoms, okay? Okay, I have a thousand sexual partners. Mm. <laughs> Will I use condoms all for right. all of them? Mm. And then we forget where does the power to negotiate for condom. All right. Come in. We do have another group of panelists that are coming through, but before I let these ones go, we have a short break that is coming through. It would be unfair to you, Dennis Anguia, to not say any last pointers. In just under 30 seconds, what would you actually tell our learners who are watching right now? Today, as we celebrate mm. uh, every person's right mm. to sexual yeah. well being, mm. I say to the young generation yes, sir. that you, you have the right to lead mm. a health life. Mm. But we have to make a balance mm. between responsibility mm. and rights. And rights. Mm. Okay? We, we at, at, most, at most cases, mm. and, uh, look at that, these are my rights, these are my rights. Mm. But are you responsible? And on that note, mm -hmm. we shall leave it at that because we do have another a set of panelists who are coming uh, in away from Mr. Bassan Khan. Special thanks. Also, Mart Martha Nakato Clara, thank you very much. Dennis Anguio, too, thank you very much for coming through. Two head teachers and one representing young people, courtesy of the Sexual Reproductive Health and Rights Alliance Uganda. So, who are the next panelists? Yes, Charles Owekumeno. He is the national coordinator at Sexual Reproductive Health and Rights Alliance Uganda. And we also will be having James Tumusina the country director, Richard Hand, Uganda, and we'll also be talking to Talima. Yes, David, I see you, sir. The executive director, Straight Talk Foundation, Uganda, both of whom will be joining me after this break. We'll be right back. A very good evening. Welcome back to this very pertinent conversation that is largely focusing on sexuality education. The global theme is Turn It On, Sexual Health in a Digital World. And our contextual theme is focusing on, uh, yeah, sexuality education amidst digitization and COVID-19. What do we mean? The COVID-19 pandemic wreaked havoc. You did see so many of the, the economies shut down. Schools were shut down. So we did call on to members of the public, especially our children, to veer onto the internet and see to it that they get this information from the net but then they've been trapped there are so many perpetrators that are taking advantage of our children on the internet how do we make it safe that is the sixty-four thousand dollar question because we really need the internet in this new normal i do have the national coordinator for sexual that is a um, sexual health and rights alliance uganda that is mr charles owek meno he's joining us right now he's not alone david talima he is the executive director of straight talk foundation uganda he's also here we also do have mr james musime the country uh, director Rich a hand Uganda or Rahu. Gentlemen, a very good evening. Thank you for joining me right here on this set. It's really, really pertinent that we have this conversation in technical terms. I'll kick off with uh, Mr. Owak Menu Charles, the National Coordinator, Sexual Reproductive Health and Rights. What entails sexuality education, Charles? Uh, thank you, Romeo. Hmm. Um, sexuality education, it's a broad term that really means a lifelong process of giving information to mm. an individual lifelong keyword to in to understand who they are to understand the different changes that occurs in their life as they grow mm. i call it lifelong because sexuality education goes up to even there is an element that we don't talk about of menopause and and andropause and all that but i want to bring it home for young people when we're talking about sexuality mm. education for young people we are talking about the process of giving them information mm. to understand who they are, to understand the different changes that happens in their life as they grow and what each of those changes means 
in terms of the risk that comes with them, in terms of the responsibilities that come with them, in terms of the possible actions that they can engage in and can risk their life. So they need to understand all those. I want to also bring it back uh, in term with practical example. For example, when a girl grows and is, she's reaching adolescence, she has the, she will receive her first manic, which is her first menstruation. And so sexuality education is supposed to, to help her understand mm. what menstruation is, what it means for her body, what it means for her life, what's the responsibilities that come with it, how can she take care of herself, what the risk mm. that is there. So mm. this girl is supposed to be guided to understand that, such that when it comes to that time, they are able to take the responsibility on their own. So it's really about giving these young people progressive information to understand the different changes that happens as they grow mm -hmm. and the responsibility that comes with it. And that information is so important for them because it helps them when they are interacting with the rest of the world, mm -hmm. with the rest of the people, to first understand who they are, to understand what is happening in their <coughs> world and be able to act accordingly and take responsibility and that's what we mean that they will be able to make informed choices mm. but also they will be able to understand that here i'm at risk because this i have known that mm. when i engage in this kind of behavior Indeed. the risk will comes with yes. it but also what option do i have to mm. keep myself safe Indeed. so that is really the locus of sexuality. And that is, it's also worth many for you, and of course I've been working with Charles on the People's Parliament of the whole of the tail end of 2020. We're working on so many initiatives to ensure that we impart this kind of information among our learners. There was that conversation that was taking center stage in Jinja. A workman called me and he said, Romeo, come. I want you to be the moderator uh, for this conversation. But then I had morning attentive the next day, so I had to do that morning show first, then make my way all the way to Jinja. Guess what I did? I didn't get a car. I took a border border from Kampala here all the way to Jinja. So the big idea is, as a leader, when you're called on to maybe there's a, an emergency, what do you do? Do you push it under the rug and say, I'll address this tomorrow? If a young girl calls in and says, I've been defied as a police officer, what do you do? Do you say we shall send a police truck tomorrow to investigate? We need proactive people, not reactive people. We also do have uh, a member of the government, Mr. Mondo Chateka, the Assistant Commissioner for Youth and Children, is on the line and is also joining us right now. A very good evening, Mr. Mondo Chateka. Thank you for joining us. Good evening, Lomio, and thank you for hosting uh, this program. I'm happy to be talking about an issue which is so central to everybody. Indeed. And we, we are glad you could come because we were seeking some kind of redress. Um, we are getting information according to the National Sexuality Education Framework. Yes, young learners as young as 15 are engaging in sexual acts. 68% are the young girls by the age of 15. They know what sex is. They've engaged in it. 62% are the boys. They know what sex is by the age of 15 and they are engaging in the same heinous practice. And we also do know between the ages of 15 to 24, these same young girls have already 5% acquired or been infected with HIV. What comes to your mind when you hear such stuff? statistics, Mr. Mordechatek? Of course, it, they send some shockwaves mm. because we are talking about a country which is trying to nurture its human capital base. And if people are going to get pregnant and drop out of school at 13, at 14, at 15, mm. then we don't get where we want to be. Mm. One of the cardinal principles, the cardinal pillars, of the National Development Plan 3 is about building a human capital base that is that will be responsible for the social economic transformation of the country. And therefore, when such things happen, it means that there is something missing somewhere. There is somebody who is not doing his duty to give correct information to the young people. And so young people are venturing into areas you know, thinking they are going to be adventurous. And as they do, they get into big trouble by getting pregnant and therefore dropping out of school. And so it is important that everybody, beginning from the parents at home, that they do their job of providing correct information. Mm. I watched I watched when Clara was, uh, you know, uh, expounding on a number of issues. Yes, and one of the issues mm. 
that the father brought information to her, and that information saved her to be the Kilala that we can see today. Mr. And Mo therefore, Go ahead. There, therefore, as a ministry, we have gone beyond talking about just parents, talking about sexuality education, but generally parenting. Having people who are called fathers and mothers does not qualify them to be parents. We want to have parents, parents who have what it takes to nurture, guide, protect, and love their children unconditionally. Therefore, we have the parenting guidelines, and we have gone ahead now to develop a policy, a family policy, mm. which would also mention the roles of the different people in the home, including the children themselves, in as far as their obligations are concerned. Because oftentimes we talk about the rights of the young people and we forget to talk about the important thing of their obligations. They have a right to protect themselves. And so when you are nurturing them early enough, and you see, I have a problem with these so-called uncles. People every time naming people titles that are not theirs. Hmm. I want to take a radical departure. Hmm. Let's call people by their own names Thank and you. by their own titles. Thank if they are friends, hmm. they are friends. Thank it you. doesn't qualify them to become uncles or my children oh. when we don't belong in the same class. Thank because you. Because the nearer such elements have moved near our children, the trouble that we have seen hmm. during COVID, hmm. incest and a lot of other things happening within the homes, our children getting pregnant, and these people going scot-free because the relatives will say, eh, but you see, mm. you know, that is a friend for a long time, Indeed. and you know from friendship is now a clan is name. Indeed. That is dangerous. And indeed, I've been also very skeptical, uh, skeptical of such people because... Uh, yeah, it has been happening too many, uh, one too many times. Uh, this person is considered a family friend, but then before you know it, this person is sleeping with one of the girls within the family setting, and incest is increasing. And of course, the Ministry of Gender, Labor and Social Development did uh, produce a communique around September 16th of last year, and you were saying the online government learning program was exposing young children to incest. Expand more on that. Is it still continuing, and how bad is it? Can you come in, Romeo? Uh, you conducted a study that was in uh, 2020, around September. It was 16th, a uh, Wednesday. You said that uh, the online learning program uh, that was being manned by government was actually exposing our children to incest or pornographic sexual acts. I can't hold a comment in affirmation. I know that, uh, well, as children are uh, learning online, they are so brilliant mm. that they can change from one channel another mm. and therefore be exposed to uncensored information but the online learning government did it in good faith that that was the only option that during abnormal times but we also know that not everybody in this country has access to a tv has access to a radio and so it's grappling somewhere in the dark trying to find a solution that can fit into a big section of people but not reaching everybody. And so to that extent, I, I think government has tried to do its level best. But then there are those problems of what programs are coming on TV. How, who censors this program? Who is going to speak? What are they going to speak about? And so in a situation where the children are left at home and maybe the father and the mother have gone to look for, you know, uh, to, to, to work, then the children can be at liberty to change from one channel to the other. Know very well that these children seem to be uh, more versatile and more amiable when it comes to ICT. And so they can do anything. And so when we are talking about laws, when we are talking about uh, the do's and don'ts, when we are talking about, uh, for, for, we're talking about uh, parenting guidelines, all these things must be put into play that the parents should know that the children we are nurturing today, mm. they are brilliant children. They are not the children of 200 years ago. Yes, These are, are different children that have access and know how to manipulate the gadgets that we have. Mr. Jadeka, putting the parents aside, we also do have a national sexuality education framework that has largely not been implemented in the last two years. 
What do you make of that? Don't you think that's the reason as to why we are here in this same situation whereby we have skyrocketing t teenage pregnancies largely because the government did not do its part to implement this policy? Well, the policy is under implementation. Mm. The sexuality education framework for the in-school mm. is under implementation, but with caution Sorry. that some of the sub-religious leaders mm. disagree with some of the elements within the sexuality education framework. Right. And so we are in dialogue with them to make sure they, they, they come on, to make sure that they fully understand mm. what we are talking about in sexuality education for the in school. The Minister of Gender, meanwhile, mm. is working on sexuality education guidelines for the out of school. So when we add the two, mm. sexuality education framework within the school and sexuality education guideline for those out of school, mm. I think we can get a whole. But also, we are struggling to ensure that we are speaking the same language. Right. The religious and cultural leaders should understand what we are talking about. And so that way, we can move as a combined force mm. and be able to address some of the vagaries that, we are, that are happening within our media. All right. Amanda Chateke is the assistant uh, commissioner in charge of young uh, children and the youth under the Ministry of Gender, Labor and Social Development. Thank you very much. I do have more questions for you. We'll revert. Let's now talk to David Talima, the executive director of Straight Talk Foundation Uganda. L we've been largely talking about what government has been doing, what its role is when it comes to imparting this kind of information among our young learners or young people within the country. But then we've largely neglected the conversation about the role of civil society organizations like the Sexual Reproductive Health and Rights Alliance Uganda, like yourself, Straight Talk Foundation Uganda, and Mr. James Tumusime's Richard Hand Uganda. So largely, in your case, at Straight Talk Foundation Uganda, what kind of uh, help have you fronted in this fight uh, uh, to actually achieve sexuality education among our young learners? Okay, um, uh, thank you, Romeo. Um, uh, I think uh, the issue of uh, sexuality education uh, found us running. Mm -hmm. We've been on ground since... Uh, uh, 1996 Indeed. and so uh, the issues and the challenges uh, around sex sexuality education found us already on ground running mm. you really have and my generation and we basically <coughs> and we basically <laughs> target uh, 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 young people between the ages of 10 and 24 mm. uh, in and out of school just like uh, uh, the Commission has, has, has talked mm. about so that is the very sensitive age mm. ages that age bracket that we, we, we target mm. and so it found us already on the ground running mm. And so we into the business of, uh, of uh, social behavior, behavior change communication. Mm. And uh, we deliver this to the young people. And we're not only looking at the young person per se, but we are looking at the sub systems, the sub structures, mm. other structures around the young pe person that can help the young person understand issues even when we are not yeah. on ground. Mm. So we talk about the parents, we talk about um, uh, the leaders, we talk about the religious leaders, just uh, uh, religious and cultural leaders, just like uh, the commissioner has talked about. And so in institutions and, uh, and of course in, in the communities. And so for us, what, what we've done is um, uh, in the era of uh, COVID-19, of course, that's, right. that's, that's where, where, where the issue is. In the era of COVID-19, we've, we've looked at how we can tap into what the, 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 the platforms that we already have mm. of getting to the young people that we've already uh, we've been using uh, uh, since time immemorial and see how do we amplify this. Talk about the radio, mm. talk about uh, um, the, the, the social media, web pages and so on, Twitter, uh, Facebook, uh, WhatsApp. Okay, we all we have all these. And so it's, it's now a time when we need to amplify this because then we'll, we're not able to reach to the young person per se mm. uh, on the face to face. Yes. But we have the platforms where we can reach. And mm. so we are amplifying on this okay. and trying to see how do we reach the, with, with what kind of information. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yes. And so uh, we're riding on that and we're seeing ourselves being able to, to, to get to the young people. Mm. And also on top of that, we also. Uh, trying to amplify the, the print. All right. And, 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 and of course, today we'll be this looking at... This is largely digital. Exactly. Mm. Uh, both digital and, and, and physical, and yes. uh, you know, s hard copies. Yes, I'm going to task you on the, on the physicality bit. Go yes, mm. yeah. Yep. So we, we're trying to do the online. Mm. We, we send out the, the young talk. Right. That's for the young adolescents. And then we send out uh, the straight talk. 
which is for the older adolescents. And what we're saying is, can the young people, can the parents mm. be able to tap into that? For the young people that can reach and, uh, those platforms and c can then access that information. And of course, we shall be launching the Straight Talk and Young Talk Lockdown Edition. Just Af keep it here. Affirmative. Go ahead. And so we're saying, parents, can you uh, support the, 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 the young people, get these papers, Indeed. okay? Print them out, take them home, mm -hmm. read them, sit together and read them and discuss what are issues here. And we have voices of different young people from different parts of the country, you know, writing in and, and, and trying to inform others about how the challenges that they're going through mm -hmm. and how they're dealing with those challenges. So that you share those best practices. Exactly. Indeed. So but that's then, here are the statistics that we've received, and of course I'm going to task you on the challenges you've uh, encountered as stakeholders when it comes to implementation or expediting projects that go a long mm -hmm. way in disseminating sexuality education information. Well, penetration of the internet, because we are largely talking about an online initiative, but then the online penetration in Uganda is actually very low. That's what we are getting right here in Uganda. So, meaning the people in the rural areas might largely be missing, missing out on this vital information, especially for the last two years as sure. we are grappling with continued learning on, online. And also we are getting information that according to the statistics, um, teenage pregnancies have been rife within the rural areas, 27%, and uh, in the urban areas, 19%. So largely we should be targeting people who are not on the internet. Yep. Isn't that a problem? And it, don't you think it's going to be a challenge that the people who are most affected are not on the grid? Okay, so, so, so the online papers, mm. for example, that we've left them for, the, for, yes, the, for those that can ac mm. access, mm. say, the, around the cities and so on and so forth, mm. those can, that can get on the internet mm. and so on. Like I said, we have the print, uh, right. the physical print that we take down. And the fact that COVID-19 has restricted us in terms of reach, we have our own structures that we've put on ground. In the rural areas. Young people trained mm. as uh, junior journalists. Mm they are in constant interactions with with their fellow young people like at that. family level at you know home level mm. and so these are the young people that pick these papers at the sub counties and take them down to the young people that are going to be reading uh, these mm. and of course when they take them down we encourage them to read them as uh, smaller groups mm. and discuss issues if there are any issues that or questions that they, they, they come up with the junior journalists get them back to us and tell us these are the issues. And those ones are again revisited in the next paper that, that we'll, we'll be writing. Amazing. So, uh, and then we have our peer education structure yeah. still at, at the community level, mm. in, you know, in the rural areas. Indeed. These are very key strategic young people that are able to take information. Even the, the, the Minister of Education uh, materials mm. that have, have been sent out. Mm. These have been very key structures that have been able to get and these And I'll state it unequivocally right here on NTV Uganda that uh, Straight Talk Foundation has been doing some good work on, in the grassroots. At right. least I've been seeing your literature one too many times in many of the schools I've gone to as a young learner. Yes, you've been doing the most in helping disseminate this information among our children. All right, that is David Talima. Yes, he's the executive director of Straight Talk Foundation Uganda. He shall be launching the Straight Talk and uh, Young Talk Lockdown Edition right here and right here here during this show, around 6.40. Yep. Yes, we shall be launching that. Let me also bring in James Tumusime, the country director, Richard Hand, Uganda. James Tumusime, I do also have statistics uh, when it comes to the religious institutions. This country is largely a religious one. 85% um, of this of the population are Christians, actually. Staunch Christians who believe in those staunch Christian values, meaning the conversation on sexuality education has caused a lot of debate in those religious circles. They do not want to have this conversation. Help us understand why. And do you think this is this kind of resistance is the reason why we've fallen into this debacle with skyrocketing cases of teenage pregnancies and so forth, largely because the stakeholders who would have helped us are adamant to talk about this subject, religious leaders. Well, thank you, Romeo. Mm. I'm happy to be here. Indeed. I want to first appreciate the existence of Straight Talk, you know. Indeed. I think Straight Talk was the one that ushered me into this space of sexual and reproductive health. Indeed. Many years ago when I was in senior two, three mm. in Nyakasura school. Yes, James. I like the question you're asking, but uh, the question you're asking is also very contextual. Indeed. You know, it's not until about I would say a hundred and a few years ago mm. uh, that we were named then Christians, Muslims, or mm. whatsoever. Uh, before that, we were still people and were there. Yes. And then, even before that time, we were having a lot of challenges discussing sexual health and sexuality. Mm. 
in different parts of this country, there were punishments for girls that uh, got pregnant before they got married. Mm. Uh, you know, I've heard of something like Chisizio somewhere in the extreme West Kabale, mm. okay. where girls who became pregnant without getting married were actually thrown and killed mm. to set an example uh, that it's not good and it ashames the family. Mm. Uh, so I think coming from that far until now, uh, the world has gone through a lot of civilization. We do no longer have the option of killing our girls because they have become married, I mean, they have become pregnant before uh, the family has received any, re any returns from them. Mm. And on the contrary, we are moving into a world of transition where we are very happy that uh, the second vice president of Uganda has emerged. Mm. We are happy that in the neighboring countries like uh, Tanzania, the president is a woman. So it takes a lot of effort. It takes a lot of evolution in the way we do things mm. to reach the level of having a female vice president, but also with the ambition mm. that we can have a female president. Mm. Now, those efforts can only be nurtured and come to be realized by changing approach. Mm. So we can no longer kill our girls. Mm. We have everybody would pride to say that the vice president is my my sister the vice president is my auntie yeah. but a lot of work has gone into her to become the vice president over years she's actually a military officer yeah. that means that uh, she has skipped several obstacles mm. from her cultural experience as a lady, for mm. example, from the Eastern region. Mm. Uh, we know that the Eastern region is one of those places where teenage pregnancy, girls get married off very early. Mm. They have very little opportunity for school. Mm. So that means people did something different. Mm. So people doing something different does not require to know that these were Catholics, these were Protestants, these were Muslims. The ambition is the same. Mm. So for us, I don't think we have a problem with anybody who has an ambition to raise mm. the quality of the population of this country. Indeed. You know, having said that, Makere, Mary Stewart had a logo that, uh, uh, I mean, an, uh, uh, is it a mission statement or something? Mm. A woman educated is a nation educated. Indeed. I don't know how it was well written, but for me to say, is that when you educate a woman, you build a nation. You build a nation. Mm. So for me, needless to say, mm. is that I am sure all the religious groups have the same ambition. I see that when one of our own is made a prime minister, we are happy, and it's a female. We are acknowledging it. So we have moved all over the world, Americas of this world, the Britain of this world, where we have a need for equal status of people. Mm. We need to overcome the so-called glass ceiling for the women. But that can only be done mm. if the right investments are done from the grassroots. One of the things that block the ambitions of many girls and young women is sex-related challenges, which include getting pregnant early when they cannot continue and have school and therefore lose their ambition. Indeed. Once you have succeeded and you are a minister, you are anybody, no one cares at what time you began to use contraception. No one cares at what time you actually had your first sexual intercourse. Mm. Everyone looks at the result. So not to say that uh, we do not have an obligation to mm. protect morals, to protect everything. Mm. We have an equal obligation to look at the challenges of the day and tailor solutions that take us where we want to be. The current COVID-19 situation, for example, that we are going through is a disaster of a generation. Indeed. You know, having read a few pieces of literature, people are predicting that this disaster, the effects will last for the next 40 years. Indeed, Indeed for countries like Uganda, which had war in 1986 and below, mm. you know that it has taken us several years to reach a, a previous economic development and of the remnants are still being a, a GDP, mm. I think uh, an increase in economic development mm. of, I mean, growth of 7%. Mm. And now all of a sudden in two years, Indeed. we are struggling to say, shall we raise the 2% or something? Mm. So for us to go back to 7% will not take us two years. It will take us a lot of time. Mm. So the issue I'm making here is that all these things are interrelated. COVID-19 is a problem that we have that is going to be very expensive for us to come out mm. of and therefore we need to unify forces and if some of the basic simple things in our human capital development mm. that we can do mm. is to provide adequate information to people to understand population related factors, to understand gender related barriers because a lot of gender stereotypes have kept us at the level that we've been at for very many years mm. without wanting to recognize mm. the basic rights of 
girls and young women, mm. the basic rights of boys and young men mm. to make informed sexual health decisions. All right. When young men are exploring, their bodies are growing, their hormones are, are raging up, and they end up uh, having sexual entanglements, mm. it's not that their intention is to become fathers. Indeed. When young girls fall under these traps because of uh, the poverty that is moving around in the COVID-19 period, mm. their intention is uh, basic survival. Their mm. families can't provide for them. Their mm. families are sending them out to get mm. basic things to survive. Mm. So we need to weigh our options as a country and mm. say, mm. am I going to tell a girl who has uh, already become pregnant the first time and has a child of at 16 or 15 mm. that it's important to abstain when she's a first time mother? Mm. Or am I going to look at one who is already lured into a relationship for survival? They have ended up in a man's home because of a lack of uh, necessities. And then I'm preaching to them to be abstaining. I have to ask parents for those that are still doing it, to continue doing it, to s pick the right information, mm. basing from the range. Take care of your children. Mm. Tell them to abstain. Tell them what about sexuality is. Take, tell them what is the consequence of whatever they do. Let them be empowered. Let mm -hmm. them know that every action has a consequence. Mm -hmm. Tell them how to deal with each consequence as it turns up. Mm -hmm. So for me, uh, coming from that perspective, I think that uh, we are not opposed to anybody. Uh, we right. just have that is to James unify Timothy, our country director. Uh, that is the uh, uh, country director of uh, Richard Hand Uganda. Thank you very much for actually engaging us on that uh, subject. Uh, we still do have Mondo Chateka who is online. Um, Mondo Chateka is the assistant commissioner in charge of the youth and children under the Ministry of Gender, Labor and Social Development. Um, let's talk about what government is doing to actually uh, alleviate this challenge and uh, impart more information as far as sexual education is concerned, uh, Mr. Mondo Chateka. What kind of avenues are you looking at? Well, um, it takes a lot of <coughs> it takes a lot of efforts mm. to ensure <coughs> that the girl child is fully protected. And one of the things we have done, especially after Romeo and the Dutchman, you always like it to to quote the Violence Against Children survey, which taught us a lot of things. That one of the things that happens is that the people who abuse our children are not strangers; they are actually people who are known. They are within the vicinity. Mm. They taught us that uh, there's a lot of online abuse. Uh, they taught us that uh, actually uh, violence takes place more in the homes than in, in any other place. We have strengthened the child hope line, which provides an opportunity for everybody to report any kind of abuse, whether it has happened or you suspect it's about to happen. It's better that you, you report when you suspect it's about to happen. <laughs> because you see, that is better than, uh, you know, when you are coming to, to, to treat, at least prevent. Mr. Mondo, and so the biggest problem yeah. is that we've ended up with leaders who are reactive, not proactive. You get a phone call about a young girl who has been defiled, and then you say, no, we shall come to your household tomorrow to investigate. Why does that happen? And that's the reason I'm saying it's better that you even report when you suspect before actually the problem has happened. But, the but what we have done the for cases what like we are on this amount of is the responsiveness of the authorities. They are too slow to respond to such emergencies. What we have done, Romeo, is to ensure that we have district action centers. Right. So in addition to what we have in uh, in, 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 in Chileka, yes. we have now established over 90 action centers at the district level to help us respond in a robust manner right and we are going to go all the way to ensure that we have those district action centers mm. in every district of uganda mm. meaning 146 as it is the case for now mm. and so when things are reported at least there is an attempt less an attempt mm. but we are looking for real address of the problem people respond. And we are working with the police stations in the different parts of the country. We, as the ministry, the district action plan is uh, domiciled within the office of the probation and welfare officer in the directorate of community development. Oh. We are also using other staff that we call the parasocial workers to be able to help us respond to these vices. But also let me add very quickly All right. that uh, as more children got pregnant at home, 
with parents watching, I think that was also a call to action right. for us to understand what is happening. Because we thought that schools All right. were, were the places where our children were, uh, you know, exposed to this type of uh, pregnancy. All right. uh, Mr. Mondo Chateke, thank you very much. Um, I apologize. We are running out of time. Thank you very much for your humble submission. We do hope you'll be engaging the Uganda Communications Commission to actually monitor what kind of information our children are accessing on the internet. It's really pertinent that you do that, sir. Thank you very much. All right, that is Mono Chateka, the Assistant Commissioner in Charge of Youth and Children under the Ministry of Gender, Labor and Social Development. We are talking about sexuality education amidst the COVID-19 pandemic and overall digitization. We'll take a short break and return with the launch of the Straight Talk and Young Talk Lockdown Edition. We'll be right back. Welcome back and many thanks for staying with us right here on NTV Uganda. My name is Romeo Busik. Of course, it's a continuation of this conversation, largely focusing on sexuality education within the COVID-19 pandemic and as we peer into digitization of the world. This is the launch of the Straight Talk and Young Talk Lockdown Edition. I have Mr. David Talima, the Executive Director of the Straight Talk Foundation Uganda, is going to be explaining to us what is entailed within the Straight Talk and Young Talk Lockdown Edition. Mr. David Talima, the floor is all yours please thank you Romeo um, I'll start with the young talk with right. support from uh, the sexual and reproductive health Alliance mm -hmm. uh, straight talk foundation has been able to run uh, both the straight talk and young talk lockdown editions Amazing. and um, the young talk is basically for the uh, young adolescents uh, talk about p5 to p7 Mm. And then uh, it's also when you look at, 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 at the information, mm. yes, upper primary, we look at the information there, mm. it's soft mm. uh, and, and, and tender for that age. I'm seeing so we're looking at violence, right? We, exactly. We're looking at, uh, at, at, at um, information that is, is packaged mm. uh, by age mm. or by age group. Right. And so this one, we, 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 we can see that we involve uh, the young people and they get us the voices. Right. They talk to the fellow young people around the country, what they are going through, how they are managing the challenges. Mm. We, also, we also bring in um, health workers or what we call um, resource people. And these are people that uh, again substantiate the information that young people are saying. They give us the actual facts and, and uh, uh, to, to, to be able to, to be as accurate as possible. Yeah. We also then look at, uh, at what are uh, schools saying, if, if it's a school setting, but because they're into the communities, we get them and they tell us about what's happening in the communities. Right. So that is Young Talk. This okay. is Young Talk, largely focusing on primary five to primary seven, exactly. upper primary. Yep. So say no to violence against children. Those are some of the pointers that have been entailed. Many types of gender-based violence have also been entailed. So let's go to Straight Talk. Now Straight Talk. Okay. What is entailed in there? Straight Talk Lock Lockdown Edition yes. has um, uh, is, is basically targeting the uh, older adolescents. Talk about senior one up to um, when University? you talk about actually adolescents and young 14 people. Fourteen to twenty-five. Exactly. Nice. Okay. So um, it's again also talking about sexual and, and, and gender-based violence. All right. And uh, in the COVID setting, and you know that these are on the rise. So we're talking about uh, what's happening, how they are managing. And so these voices are, have been able to, to reach out to many other young people around the country. And of course, we bring in uh, different uh, resource people. Uh, on page three, you can see, you can see that we have uh, Gloria Adengo, uh, who is the nursing officer at Ororo General Hospital. Mm -hmm. So she's bringing her technical uh, kind of expertise and she's trying to explain a number of things uh, around that. And there then also causes and effects of sexual gender-based violence. Exactly, nice. exactly. But also, we, because uh, we know that uh, there's a lot of uh, HIV and AIDS-related information that young people need, we usually have a corner, science corner, where there are questions that are young people are asking and some of the responses that, that, that we could give mm. to the young people, from and the resource and school and people. It's really important, and David Talima, because according to the statistics, young, la young people between the, the ages of 15 to 25, 5% 5, 5 of them are getting infected with HIV. That is really important that we actually target this group. Okay. Go ahead. So 
we know that uh, mm. it's important that uh, that we give the facts about HIV yeah. AIDS, mm. but of course there are other issues related uh, under underlying issues that again should uh, be exposed. Mm. What are the, those issues that uh, uh, bring about HIV mm. infections? Indeed. So again, this is all. Uh, uh, highlighted in, in the paper. And I can also see in straight uh, the lockdown edition, they are trying to the campaign the culture of silence, keeping quiet when you're being abused. Ex expand more on that, David. Okay. How important is it to speak out? And uh, it why is it important in that case? It's and also very tell important. them that uh, it, you are complicit in the crime if you keep quiet. If you notice your neighbor's child is being abused and you keep quiet, you are complicit. Go ahead. So the issues are why are young people mm. keeping quiet? Mm. Okay? They, it's possible that they don't know yeah. the structures available. Mm. So again, as straight talk, we're trying to expose the available structures mm. and we're mm. making this known to the young people so that mm. they can report uh, to these structures. And of course, that's mm. the only way that they, they can be voicing out. All right. Yep. So these are some of the mechanisms or, make or avenues through which Straight Talk Foundation Uganda is actually alleviating this challenge and making sure that this information reaches our young learners. So what is SRHR doing in that regard? Let's also bring in the national coordinator of SRHR. Alliance Uganda. Mr. Oekumeno Charles, how is SRHR Alliance Uganda actually promoting sexual reproductive health in Uganda? Yes, uh, the first one is actually this Straight Talk nice. uh, and Young Talk Lockdown mm. Edition. We mm. partnered with our member, Straight Talk Foundation. Amazing. And uh, we wanted this to be out. Please, parents out there, now you have the information, the right information mm. to give to your children. Make sure you download it online. It will be shared throughout the different platforms. Mm. But the second one, there was some issue that was discussed about the religious leaders and their roles. Yes, John. We are actually yeah. having conversation with them. The one we started with you has continued. Just um, on Thursday, we were with those in the eastern region in Jinja. On Tuesday, we shall be for those in the western region in Barara. Then we are heading to Arua for northern Uganda. And the discussion is around the role that they can play. Indeed. Remember, we said this issue of protecting our mm. children is mm. a shared responsibility. Indeed it is. For me, what I have always been pushing for is that when the child is in the church, let mm. them get the information that the church can give them. Indeed. When they're at home, let them get the information that the parents can give mm. them. When they're at school, let them also get the information <laughs> that the school can give them. Mm. If all these environment where the children are growing up can become source of information mm. for young people mm. and safe information mm. that's when we that will be the beginning of protecting mm. them because among us all other things we are talking about yes. the police and what mm. the first line of protection is when the perpetrator approaches Indeed. that child mm. how do they react yep. do they know that there's a risk there mm. and that that capacity is only built by the kind of information I they have. I hear you. And that's why this is very important. So the other element, we are working with different civil societies that across the country with okay. Richard Hunt. Mm -hmm. We want to expand. UNESCO. UNESCO, uh, our biggest partner. Actually, this, mm. is, uh, the, this show is supported Funded. by UNESCO. Mm. And our partners like Simavi, we are working with them. Uh, under Right Here, Right Now program, we are also working with RISU. And all the members, you have seen the members of the And the UNESCO should fund the people's Parliament so that we expand more on this conversation. Exactly. But this conversation out, has we'll to be it. taken <laughs> down. But also, um, Romeo, yes. just as, as, as I, mm. I conclude, from the conversation we're having with the religious leaders, Indeed. I think one thing that is coming up mm. is that we want parents to give this information, but the, pro the challenge is that most of them do mm. not have the capacity. Mm. So we want to really begin work now mm. around mentorship mm. and building capacity mm. of all, all right. these gatekeepers to be able to perform their roles and providing proper okay. guidance and we're okay. working with the ministry. Uh, yeah. James Tumusimi is also here and he is the country director of Richard Hand Uganda. How do we ensure that all these leaflets that we are so having so here so reach all me, our lives? Me, and I'll your last parting shorts. I'll pick our work from one of the quotes in Indeed. the Young Talk today. Indeed. My parents are always fighting. When mm. my mother asks my father for money mm. to buy food, he tells her to ask the government, which put down, uh, put the lockdown in place. Mm. This leads to quarrels and fights. Mm. So one of the approaches that Richard Hand Uganda is doing with Men Engage Network mm. is to do parenting classes, okay. parenting sessions, where we are supporting parents to understand that the lockdown is not anyone's mm. problem. All right. The young people's needs are genuine needs. All right. We are doing a lot of mental health support for many parents right. to appreciate and learn how to live with their young people in harmony 
provide them the information they need mm. when they ask questions it's not about a fight mm. it's genuine need for information and learning harmonious environment we are doing a lot of online work we have our Saudi platform wherever you are you can watch the Saudi TV we have a lot of information there we have the singer right. RPTC where you can ask live questions follow our Facebook pages and you'll be able to get information that relates to your scenario All we are right. having a lot thank of thank you very much have come James out now. To yeah. see me. for more information just visit www.straighttalkfoundation.org that is yep. www.straighttalkfoundation.org special thanks to Dennis Anguio, Martha Nakato, Iklara. Special thanks to Mr. Basan Khan. Special thanks to Mr. Mondocha Taker. He's right over there on the screen. Thank you very much. We couldn't give you some last parting shots. A special thanks to you, Charles Awekumeno, David Talimer, James Tumusimi, and all the other stakeholders who are doing the most in advancing this information to our young children within this country. It is imperative that we continue this conversation on sexuality education. My name is Romeo Busiku. Have yourselves a blessed evening.